Testies and Ingrid, Ingrid Ehrenberg, thank you so much for coming. And um, today's a little special, it's part of our business program, which is being headed by Dinda Elliott. Is Dinda here? Wave your hand. Hi. Dinda. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome Dinda on board to lead our Center for Business. Um, today's program is a little bit special. Usually, Dinda's having to work real hard. And uh, she's up here moderating and interviewing. Last week, we, last week we had a Professor Bill Kirby here from Harvard Business School. And next week, we have... Um, yeah. So it's a busy time at China Institute. Thank you for why you put up. We're still in the middle of construction, so we're using these during the week when it's not a um, special program. These are classrooms. Downstairs, we've done phase one of the three phases of construction, and we're hopefully kicking off phase two, which will open up to the main street of Washington Street. Um, but today, normally I will come and introduce, um, but today I'm not going to introduce because then you're going to have to hear the whole thing over during it. a very special recording of Seneca Podcast. Um, our friends in South China are here, including Seneca Podcast, Jeremy Bohar, and Kaiser Hua. So today, you're going to be recording a special program with visiting CEO from South China Morning Post, Gary Leo. Um, everybody had their own introductions and backgrounds, but rather than me say it over and over, I think I'll just pass it over and um, let Kaiser and Jeremy um, get the show started. I don't know if you want me to say any ground rules about noise or anything. No, nope, make as much as you want. We're good. <laughs> they insist that you Keep your cell phones on. on. They want to hear the review in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a China podcast if there weren't so much. And pumpkin seeds. Um, so over to you guys. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, so uh, yeah, a couple of quick round rules. So we are. I thought there weren't any. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the, I get to say the round rule. My prerogative. Uh, so I mean, mainly the round rule is when I say like make a little noise or a uh, warm round of applause. You have to redouble your efforts and make it sound like, you know, there's like twice as many. I can use different effects to make it sound like there are more of you than there actually are, but still a little genuine enthusiasm. Uh, appreciate it, no matter how bad we end up on it. But, uh, you end up on it, what about me? Yeah, well, uh, you're good, man. <laughs> Uh, you have the recompense, at least, of you know, being CEO. Of the, I mean, I we're, we're just lowly podcasters. And, uh, so, what you, you don't do? have an understanding of my job, then we can talk about that. Well, that's what we'll talk about. We'll talk about his job. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the uh, show, we're going to stop recording and then take questions. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we won't be able to, to include your questions. We've had bad experiences with that in the past because people ask stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask any stupid questions. Make sure they're good. Uh, Not they're for that Right, that was the side. Everybody knows those cool mics, right? Like from 1920s broadcasting. These are, these are super cool. So I'm, I'm, I did record now, so I'm going to use some counter down to give the intro, and then I'm going to ask you to make a little noise and, at that point. You want to practice? All right. No, no, no. All right. So, three, two, one. Welcome yeah. to the suit. <laughs> 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 it's hard here. I can actually do the intro. It's not, it's not a tune. Three. Two, one. Welcome to this special live edition of the Cinema Podcast recorded here at the China Institute in Manhattan. Let's hear you people make a little noise. The Cinema Podcast is going to be discussion on current affairs in China, and we're produced in partnership with SubChina. SubChina is the best way to keep on top of the latest news from China in just a few minutes a day with our free email newsletter curated from 300 plus different news sources and featured more and more original writing from Jeremy Goldhorn's growing stable of contributors. So you can also check out our handy smartphone app. And of course, you can visit our website at subchina.com. It's a feast. This is political and cultural news about a nation that is reshaping the world. Yes. I am Kaiser Guo, and I'm delighted to be back in New York and joined by my BFF. That stands for Beardo Fuzzy Face. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, Jeremy Goldcorn, TUV editor in chief of South China. How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing very well indeed, and thank you. I'm delighted to see such a crowd. We were a little worried. I believe there's some kind of holiday. Here in America today, and uh, so we already know what will come. The beginning of the genocide. <laughs> <laughs> we Americans celebrate very strange. <laughs> <laughs> He's still learning our ways. He's an immigrant. Uh, 
<laughs> so the Americans are very inscrutable. We are. They're trying to find the. It's absolutely impossible to understand the politics and culture of Actually, this country. Actually, Americans are simpletons for the most part. Yeah, Someone's being fucking morons. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the South China Morning Post has long been uh, Hong Kong's paper of record and has been a regular part of my reading diet now since I began to take any kind of serious interest in China way back in the 1980s. Uh, like all newspapers, uh, this is a, an age of, of digital disruption with often all sorts of challenges. And you know, like all papers, it's had its ups and downs. But the venerable SCMP has, I think, surprised uh, many of us uh, in the last year or so by really stepping up its game. Uh, it's no longer paywall. Let's hear a round of applause for that. That does not imply that South China will always be free. Let me just make sure that that was clearly. Uh, it's a lot of paywall, but despite it, and, and, and despite its uh, widely reported ownership change and, and the increasing control that Beijing seeks to exert over all sorts of media outlets, the SCMP has, uh, you know, become neither a vehicle for the veneration, neither a vehicle for the veneration of Chairman Xi, or for the veneration of Chairman Ma. Uh, so that's been pretty good. Uh, the paper has uh, faced interesting challenges in a very polarized Hong Kong, where you know, growing tensions between citizens who seek a greater say in their affairs, uh, are meeting with an increasingly intolerant uh, business and political elite who run Hong Kong, but are loyal to Beijing for the most part. So we are delighted to be joined today by Gary Liu, uh, who was appointed CEO of the SCP in November 2016. Before joining the South China Morning Post, uh, Gary was CEO of Day, which was a wildly popular service that many of us used uh, back in the day to recommend interesting content on the web. Um, Gary has uh, also been the head of Spotify Labs. He was born in California, spent his childhood in Taiwan and in New Zealand, which I have with the rest of my family living in some lovely, and has lived here in the States for most of, his, of, of the last 20 years. Gary, you're welcome to Snapchat. Thank you so much, Ben. <laughs> Sounds like I should also come back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if you say that at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, we think your next job. I didn't say I was going to come back with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gary, for those of us who haven't worked in a modern media organization, so what's the job description of a CEO? And uh, just importantly, what don't you touch and, uh, and instead relegate entirely to the editorial leadership? In other words, what's the division of labor between you and the South Carolina Lawyer Press Editor Chief County Pat? I definitely don't want to speak for all modern day media companies because the job of the CEO is very different from one news organization to another. Historically, news organizations have had a very clear Chinese wall between editorial and business and usually have someone running editorial, either called the editor or something else to that effect, and then someone running business, often known as the publisher. And they run their separate sides of the business, both report to the board. That is actually quite rare as a structure now. In the SCMP, I'm the chief executive officer, and the entire company, including editorial, reports into me. That said, I'm very, very fortunate that we have an incredible editor-in-chief and massive leadership uh, led by Tammy Tam, the editor-in-chief, and they run and own the editorial voice, the newsroom, uh, what the paper publishes, what the online channels publish on a daily basis. Uh, and 99.9% .9 of the time, I do not have to involve myself at all. In fact, you don't really want me to be involved. One thing I'm sure we'll get into is the fact that I'm not from a journalism background. And so the reality is my job is to be there to be a, an intellectual partner to Tammy, which I haven't earned the right to be yet, because she's wicked smart, and uh, it's something that I will eventually earn my way into, uh, to be a moral partner to Tammy, especially as a news organization, we have to have very strong convictions. And then third, to be an operational partner to Tammy, to make sure that the business is there for the newsroom to be able to continue doing what it does. Yeah, I mean, you, you say you don't have uh, experience in the media business, really, but I mean, Dig was really essentially a news site, uh, at the very least a news aggregator. Um, did you have any other relevant experience connected to news before taking on this role at the South China Morning Post? Dig definitely. I spent about two years at dig.com and it really was a fascinating time to be trying to bridge the gap between the value of high quality content creation and the value that consumers are willing to pay for it. 
And our role at Day, our job, was really to actually create discovery that was quality enough that could actually uh, give you an alternative to other discovery channels, namely Facebook, and in that process, close the gap. Um, and, and through that experience, I got to spend quite a bit of time with not only our venerable news organizations here in the United States, who are all looking for that alternative to social media distribution, but also get to learn from the top bylines, the top journalists all over the world mm -hmm. who had a fascination with our business and wanted to work directly with us to get their highest version or highest quality journalism to their readers more directly. So that was certainly an enlightening experience. Um, but the reality is, Jeremy, that my entire career has been around media technology. It's the need to intersection between media and technology. And even though I was definitely not smart enough to plan it this way, every step of my my career has been learning about how to create, distribute, and monetize content on the internet. So did you have any misgivings um, when you opted to take this job? Um, uh, I mean, you must have had some appreciation for the sorts of challenges you'd be facing. It hasn't exactly been smooth sailing at the SCMP in the last decade. There have been a lot of changes in the editorial uh, department at the very, very top. Uh, and, and then, you know, Shang Wei, uh, Wang Shang Wei was certainly, I mean, I, I mean, not deservedly, but he was regarded as a pretty controversial figure. Uh, he was distrusted by some. Uh, former editor. Perhaps. Yeah, for, former editor. And, and you know, uh, so just give us a sense of, of what you thought you were getting into. Uh, what was going through your head as you, as you weighed taking this job? For the record, we're five minutes in, so thank you for that soft <laughs> beginning. <laughs> I, would, I, I went into this job quite eyes wide open. Uh, I, I certainly didn't pull the trigger without, without doing a heck of a lot of research and having a lot of conversation with not only the owners of the paper, the previous executive team, the current executive team, and a lot of other folks. I've been very lucky enough in my, I've been lucky enough in my life to be surrounded by folks who understand China, who understand the dynamics of China and certainly Hong Kong who have worked in both journalism and academia and both of those two, uh, well, both sides of the Pacific and I spent a lot of time in research. Here's what I found. I understood that, yes, it, 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 we have to acknowledge it that the South China Morning Post definitely had um, a, a history of Tamil, or at the very least a recent history of Tamil. And part of it was that over the course of 10 years, the SCMP had about 10 editors. And when you are a news organization with that kind of turnover at the very top of your newsroom, it's hard to establish an identity and a set of convictions about what your purpose is and what your value to the world is. By the way, I believe that we are well over that at this point. During that period of time, at the end of that 10 years, uh, the, the, the last editor in that 10 year period that was appointed was Wang Xiangwei. Now let me say this up front. Being the editor-in-chief of the South China Morning Post, in my opinion, is one of the hardest jobs in the entire news industry. Because reporting on China in an objective way is one of the hardest things to do in news. And Xiang Wei, who I have actually gone to know quite well because he remains an editorial advisor to the newspaper, and I'm thankful that he still remains an editorial advisor to us. Xiang Wei is a conflicting figure for a bunch of different reasons. Um, first of all, I think that you should invite him on the show. Oh yeah, I'd love to. I think, uh, I think he'd be an incredible guest, and, and his depth of knowledge on China is absolutely fascinating. He was the first mainland-born editor of the South China Morning Post, which had a very long history as really a colonial paper in Hong Kong, run by the, uh, the, the, the elite class um, and leading members of Hong Kong society, which were to be very honest, primarily of British descent. The actual newsroom itself was a lot of old Fleet Street uh, newsmen and women, and they were incredible at what they did, but as China changed, the owners at the point in time, and I certainly wasn't there, so I can't speak to that decision, decided that there was a need for change at the very top of the newsroom. And Xiang Wei, I think, just by the nature of who he was, to some degree, was controversial. Now, I will say this. One of the major issues that I encountered, and, and this was part of the diligence process from my point of view before I started in the job, I found that the South China Morning Post uh, was bad at communication, which is fun when you're a media company, it's ironic, but we, we have a tendency to be that way. 
it's because I think as a news company, we never wanted to be the news. We just wanted to report on the news. And also as a Chinese company, culturally, we're very, very bad at owning and telling our own story. And those two things coming together meant that over the course of the period of transition, the SCMP allowed everyone else to own the narrative. And, and when you're not transparent about transformation within a news organization that at that point had 110 years of history, a lot of things, when, when they're opaque, have a tendency to look insidious. And it really, it's, it's so much more innocuous than anyone honestly believes. And so part of the new leadership now, especially with me at the helm, our MO is to be transparent both internally and externally. So what do you think triggered the actual, the onset of this period of two almost 10 years ago? What do you think was the point of inflection? I'm sure you've done a lot of sort of analysis of what, what happened in, in the run-up to your taking over. Honestly, even with all of my research, my, my, my research, but the, the, the amount of time I spent in diligence was figuring out what the SCMP is today. For the job that I was about to take on, the owners that are new that I was going to work for, the executive leadership that I was going to participate in. My diligence was about them, was about that. The history I have learned since I have been there, I've spent a lot of time talking to folks who've been in our newsroom for 20, 30 years. I've also talked to plenty of people who were in our newsroom who are still hanging around uh, Hong Kong and have an enorm enormous well of, uh, of experience to share with me. But my experience, to be clear, my diligence was, the, was about the company as it is and what I was taking over. I cannot speak to what started the tumult. I have no idea what the owners were thinking 15 years ago that led to a 10-year period where there was constantly changing leadership at the top of the newsroom. I'm just glad that today, the organization that I get to be a part of is one that has found stability and certainly found a leader in Tammy Tam uh, that I believe over the course of the next few years is going to bring more and more conviction to our reporting. So <clears throat> I'd like to get back to conviction and politics uh, and the difficulties therein a little bit later, but can we uh, also ask about the business challenges? You know, uh, can we start with the set of challenges presented just by the digital transformation itself, which of course is a challenge that all newspapers uh, that have been print-based have faced or are facing. Um, does it help you perhaps that you don't have a kind of legacy idea of how a newsroom used to run in terms of planning for the future and what are your plans? You're talking about me specifically versus the South China Morning Post, right? Well, I, both. Let's talk about both. So I have been asked this a lot um, about whether or not the fact that I have not grown up in a traditional newsroom is an advantage or disadvantage for this job. I'm not sure it's that either way. I, I don't know what the owners and the board would say to that if you were to ask them. I still, at some point, need to get a real answer from them about why they took such a big bet on hiring me and whether or not they regret it 10 months in. <laughs> but I think that um, that is actually important. It's, it's important not to be weighed down by a legacy of how it's always been done, but it's also important to understand why it used to be done the way it was. Part of it is that in transformation, you can't go into a 114-year-old news organization with 1,100 employees and say, we're in 2017, so this is a new way we're going to do things. You can't do that. There is, you, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is institutional knowledge of how journalism, high, how high-quality journalism is created. Everything uh, that has led up to this point has created the legacy as well as the credibility and authority of the South China Morning Post, and there's no way I'm going to throw that out as part of transformation. As well as, of course, the newsroom itself, we have incredible journalists, incredible editors who've been with the company, been in the industry for decades, and our organization would look dramatically different. We would not be as good as we are today without them. So this transformation, the default, is that my expectation is that all those folks who have been in the company for a long time will be there at the end of the transformation. That they will participate with us, they'll learn new skills, they will tell us the things that we need to keep, the things that we can change and participate. And so knowing how the newsroom ran in the past allows us to figure out how best to be able to change it, to be able to uh, actually incrementally create in the process of transformation. Well, how are you going to make money? Wait. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy question too. Don't, don't play the Rachel stage. 
<laughs> no, let's, 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 let's take that, get to that one later. I want to ask you, well, at least one thing that I, I noticed is one challenge you've certainly risen to and one problem the legacy problem needs addressed is if the SCMP ever suffered from communication difficulties, can I get an amen? I mean, this guy can communicate pretty well, yeah? Yeah. Amen. 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 Well, that was a little weak. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Come on. Can I, say, can I get an amen? I want to hear it. Anyway, uh, so what are some of the, 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 uh, the changes that you have implemented? Uh, when Jeremy, take notes here because we want to see how this is done. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you somewhat of a rehearsed answer. And it's rehearsed because, Jeremy, to your point, it's actually really important for our own organization, our newsroom, to understand how we're going to transform. So I've been spending a lot of my energy communicating. Well, sorry, when you say transform, do you mean make money? Uh, no, 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 no. I actually, right now, this moment in time, the transformation I'm talking about is to make the South China Morning Post a digital media company because our mission is to lead the global conversation about China. That is actually our mission statement. And for us to be global, we cannot be just a print newspaper because I am not going to go city to city find contract printers, print newspaper, and then distribute on trucks anymore. So we have to be digital. So actually the transformation from being print to digital is, is a way to get to the end goal, and the goal is to be of global impact. So the transformation I'm talking about is to increase reach and impact of such kind of money post reporting. So yeah, so what are some of the specific things that you do? So let's cut this up into three different pillars of change. The first is cultural and identity. The second is process and structure. The third is product and technology. I'll very briefly address each of the three and then we can dig into them if you want. All right, culture and identity is a big one. It's actually the first thing I started working on when I arrived. As an organization, for us to change in today's media environment, we need to be able to react fast. Honestly, any media company that tells you that they know what consumption behavior is going to look like in five years, is either lying to you or they're way too arrogant. They actually don't know. None of us know. Right. The change rhythm, the change cycle in technology today is no longer five years. It's not even one year. Every six months, new consumption behaviors pop up that we as a news organization have to be enlightened about. And so our organization, our company, needs to be able to react fast. More than anything else, they react fast. So there needs to be a new culture of agility, a new culture of experimentation, uh, no longer a fear of failure, and absolutely there needs to be a better culture of transparency and communication, both internally and externally. Okay, so that's culture and identity. Those are big ones. Yeah. The second, process and structure. To react fast, we actually need to know how our business is doing. And as a traditional news organization, what I found was a company that uh, really was, and this is, by, by the way, just to be clear, I'm probably being unfair to the previous executive leadership, uh, because they, they did move the company much faster than when they found it. Uh, but what I found was still a traditional organization that was looking at metrics much more, in, much, it was too infrequent, and we were too slow on figuring out what was going right, what was going wrong with the business. And so we had to change that process, that cadence of operating. At the same time, from a structure point of view, the newsroom was structured as a newspaper, which meant that the desks reflected the sections of the newspaper, that the actual uh, roster and the cadence of the newsroom reflected the newspaper, which meant that we still had a legacy of people coming in the early afternoon, starting their day, uh, really writing and, and, and working towards this 11.30 off stone time, which is not how the digital media world works. And so we had to restructure for that. I have 300 people in the newsroom focused on how the newspaper next tomorrow morning looked. And the newspaper is a Hong Kong specific product for a much smaller group. It is a declining percentage of our overall readership. It is in single digit percentages at this point. And so we had to restructure the newsroom to focus on digital. So that's the second piece. The third one, of course, is product and technology. I can talk all day about this. Let me simplify it for you. The way that we're thinking about editorial product and technology is that there are two different kinds of platforms. There are discovery platforms and consumption platforms. And every permutation between those two is a different editorial product. Trust me, that increases the complexity. Reporting is already incredibly difficult. Having to think about how your reporting shows up to different people in different contexts across different permutations of platforms 
it exponentially increases the complexity. And you can only solve it with technology. And so we're rebuilding from ground up and investing heavily on the engineering side of the business. OK, now I will not be denied my question. <laughs> the, the quick answer is, Jeremy, I don't know yet. Oh, man. <laughs> and, uh, one of the advantages of having an owner that today is committed to, to, to investing in news as opposed to generating margin from news is that I care about revenue, but I'm not limited by the bottom line when it comes to what I'm experimenting with and how we are growing. Which is really why the South China Morning Post newsroom is actually growing. We're hiring journalists, believe it or not. Wow. Imagine that, 2017, we're hiring journalists. We're hiring them in droves. We're investing heavily on the engineering side. We're going from an engineering team of uh, 20 people focused on consumer-facing product to 60 people in a year. On the infrastructure side, there's even more people there. And we are actually testing with all these different channels, thinking about new marketplaces. As a news organization focused on margin, we would not be able to do that. That doesn't mean we forget about revenue. I think the reality is that the news industry is still trying to shake out what long-term sustainable business model looks like. I'm hoping that our participation with the rest of the news industry will make us that in three to four years, we will have a better idea. And I do think, by the way, that better idea is a mix of revenue channels, advertising, plus subscription, plus events, plus a couple of other different things that we probably haven't even tried yet or haven't scaled yet. And when we figure out as an industry, hopefully at that point, then my board says, okay, we need to start thinking about margin. So hopefully I've earned a few years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, so the reason why you didn't even ask that question is because their parent company has a market cap north of $200 billion. Yes, yeah, so that, 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 that so, always helps. So I mean, the question I have for you is, uh, what, how, how, how has this landed on, on your, your uh, on the on ears of your newsman. How have they responded to, you know, coming in early now and, and writing a lot of frequent posts and then not, you know, gearing around the offstone of the, I mean, how, how, how has have your, the, the new changes that you've implemented uh, been received by your staff? Quite positively, actually. See, one of the advantages of, of transforming a newspaper that was for lack of, actually, let me, yeah, let me just be honest. I mean, we were, we had our first uh, non-profitable year in 2016, and we were watching as the global news industry was collapsing under its own weight, under changing economics, declining circulation of the paper product all over the world, including in Hong Kong. And there was no one in the, in the news organization at the South China Morning Post that didn't know this was happening. Right. So when you tell people that are backed into a corner, hey, we need to transform, most of them don't put up fisticuffs and fight you on it. Yeah, yeah. And so everyone, the question is not why do we need to transform, it is how, and more importantly, what does this transformation mean for me as an individual? I mean, at the end of the day, all of us care, and we, we have a right to care about our job, about our livelihood, about taking care of our family, about the passion of the, the industry that we have decided to, to enter into. And so, to my point about communication, we have spent a lot of time leading people through the process of what transformation should look like. There are some pains, but there's plenty of things to celebrate at the end of it. So, it's been actually very positive. Our newsroom journalists, editors have reacted well. They've, they've, they've started changing their daily rhythm, and they've started enjoying actually writing for digital platforms, because here's the thing, digital gives us an incredible storytelling canvas. One that journalists have never had before until now. <coughs> you can tell a compelling story, not just in words, but with pictures and videos and, I don't know, GIFs maybe sometimes, and infographics and all of these things. Real journalists who care about telling compelling stories, but then this is the golden age. This canvas is incredible, and if we give them the opportunity to do that, most of them have taken to it. And yeah, you, you guys have done some really, really interesting stuff. I mean, I, I, one thing that sticks out for me was uh, during the Belt and Road uh, uh, forum in, in Beijing Park. Uh, <laughs> there was this terrific infographic that you guys did, you know, laying out uh, the, the details of five or six major uh, Belt and Road initiative projects. And I think we, we, we talked about that on our show, right, Jeremy? Yeah. So I guess uh, the, 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 speaking of Beijing, 
I think one of the questions that everyone must be thinking about is how are you responding when, when those pressures come from Beijing uh, to, to, to the central conflict? I mean, uh, from where I sit, it looks like you guys have done a pretty admirable job. I mean, you're, you can't, I, I wouldn't uh, call you out too badly on some, you, you covered the Tiananmen commemoration on, on June 20th, you covered uh, Li Xiaobo's death, uh, you, you, you've done, I think, quite a bit of, of pretty hard hitting stuff that I was frankly Beijing probably wasn't entirely happy with, right? Uh, but, you know, I guess it's, it's probably fair to say that there, you know, you talk about Bo and Wei as well. Uh, uh, maybe you yeah, got, we get under their skin if that's what you're getting yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting at that, right? But, you know, I'd also know that you guys have published a clutch of articles that, you know, cause the SCMP's critics to whoop at the, the paper's apparent submission to the Communist Party line as well. But, um, you know, you, you come under any you come under direct pressure? Or is it indirect? Um, how does it come to you when it comes? I think it's, first of all, it's important to remember that the South China Morning Post is 100% blocked in China, and we do not publish news in Chinese. Wait, it's not blocked in China right now. I checked this today. No, it's, I mean, we get a, I get a report every single day about what percentage of the side it's 97, 98%. Okay, so fine, I lied a little bit here. Um, I think sometimes... The Belt and Road Forum infographic was not blocked. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and, and our, uh, whatever, the Hangzhou 20, uh, G20 site may not be blocked. But in general, our journalism is not accessible in China. And we, by the way, have no intent of changing that. So when, when we're talking about China, Beijing cares most about what their citizens read and watch and listen to, how they get their information. And being a Hong Kong-based news organization allows us the space, and especially a Hong Kong-based news organization that publishes in English and with a very clear goal to actually elevate the understanding of China around the world, so we're reporting out towards the rest of the world from China. Even if we report on things that Beijing within mainland China would never allow propaganda outlets, their mouthpieces, to, to talk about. Even when we publish it, and I'm sure they're not happy that we do it and, and we share with the rest of the world those aspects of China, they let us do it. For now. Um, I, I, I used to say this on a website. Uh, it was called Downway.org. And I used to say, well, I'm translating news about China into English. And Where are you doing it, Jeremy? In Beijing. OK, so that's the difference. Um, well, it is, but Hong Kong is getting a lot closer to Beijing. I mean, I guess my question is, like, what will you do when you get the call, either from somebody at Alibaba or from the government that says, you know, this thing you want to run is an existential threat to the paper? Uh, is there, like, a, a plan for that? There is no contingency plan today for that existential, existential moment. And our editorial team, what they're preparing for, at the very least, what they're working on, is making sure our convictions are strong enough that, that we communicate them well enough, that we train our journalists enough, that we approach the line and we know how to tell the compelling story of China's rise comprehensively and objectively without putting ourselves in those positions where we can run into existential issues. The commitment from our owners, and they've been extremely public about it, and they've been private about it with me over and over again, is that their intent is absolutely to protect the editorial independence and integrity of the South China Morning Post newsroom. Listen, Jack and Joe and the Alibaba leadership, they're incredibly intelligent human beings. They do not want their legacy to be, that they're, they messed up this 114 year old bastion of freedom of press in Hong Kong. And my commitment as CEO Tammy Tam's commitment as editor-in-chief is also to protect that editorial independence and integrity. And so there are layers of control and discernment here that our hope is we will be able to maintain exactly that. And yet, you, you must remember when, when uh, Alibaba's takeover was first announced and was first being talked about, uh, you, you, you can't really have it both, say, both ways. I mean, on the one hand, Alibaba was saying, that they want to absolutely preserve your editorial integrity and independence. But on the other, they were, uh, Joe Jones, I actually wrote about this in an op-ed in your paper, saying that they want to tell the China story differently. I mean, that that has a particular meaning. That that means that they believe uh, extant Western media, English, English language media coverage of China. So they 
have an editorial slant, or do they do they or not? I mean, they can't really have it both ways, can you? So I don't believe that it's mutually exclusive. The board is able to make changes at executive leadership. They can make changes at the CEO office. They can make changes for the editor in chief's role when they want. And as owners, you have every right. Every single news organization owner chooses the editor in chief. And so editorial, editorial independence or maintaining editorial independence and integrity, what that really means is once that editor-in-chief is chosen, you leave them alone and you let them operate. The reality is that that choice of editor-in-chief is in a lot of ways a reflection of the owner's own position, or at the very least their view of the world. Now, most of the people here in this room probably do not know Tammy Tam. I can tell you that if you got an opportunity to know Tammy Tam and actually know all of our senior leaders, who, by the way, we have a senior editorial ship. That's not the word. Uh, our senior editorship is seven different people holding seven different passports. I'm extremely proud of the diversity of the South China Morning Post newsroom. It's something that I don't think any other major newspaper in the world can claim, that there's that kind of diversity of thought, that diversity of background at, at the, the, the highest levels. And they challenge each other every day, by the way. If you got to know Tammy, I can tell you this, you will find her knowledge and understanding of China incredibly deep, and certainly of Hong Kong as well. Her understanding of the nuance of the relationship between China and the rest of the world incredibly deep. Her desire and conviction of being able to tell an objective truth about China to also be incredibly deep. And she was working for the paper for a long time before she was appointed. She was working for the paper for a few years. Her background is actually in broadcast journalism. She was one of the most well-known and well-respected broadcast journalists in Hong Kong for years before that. So I do think that that those I, I don't think those two things that that ownership said at, at the point of acquisition. By the way, I wasn't there, right. and um, to be honest, I think that you might advise them. Well, my language has been different, and we should talk about the Western Press thing in a second. Uh, but I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think owners have every right to say, "Here's our worldview." And, uh, and, and our news organization, or at the very least, the editor in chief, is chosen. I mean, how many newspaper owners, whether it's Murdoch or even the Salzburgers or whomever else in this world, would choose an editor in chief that uh, it is believes in the, an opposite worldview from them as an owner? I don't think we can really find an example of that. And I don't even particularly think that just finding an example of that means that we can point to that news organization and say, oh, that equals editorial dependence. Fair enough. All right, I've uh, ruled your money and politics. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. How, what is it like working with Joe Tsai and Jack Ma? Are they very hands-on? I, I don't want to pretend at all that I know Jack Ma. Too many Chinese people would come find me and ask me for introductions that I cannot make. Uh, I spent a little bit of time with Jack, and what I do know is that, I mean, he's, both Jack and Joe are incredibly intelligent human beings. Um, I spend most of my time with, with Joe Tsai because he's the chairman of the South China Morning Post. Um, now, it, our actual governance structure is very unique within Alibaba. We are a wholly owned subsidiary that because Alibaba has made a commitment to South China Morning Post operating independently, even though it is wholly owned, I actually report to a board and not directly into any individual or any division of South China Morning Post. I don't actually think there's any other one of uh, Alibaba's uh, acquisitions that, that looks like that. So my board has Alibaba members on it, including Joe, as well as uh, seats for independent directors, one of which is our previous CEO, actually, my predecessor, Robin Hu, who's from Singapore. And so I had the privilege of actually working with incredible news men and women uh, who have come through our past as editorial advisors as well as who are on that board. So um, our interaction with Joe is, my interaction with Joe is mostly about how to build through transformation. We talk a lot about the uh, culture and identity change, we talk a lot about product and technology because he really is an incredible product person. And we do actually talk a lot intellectually about what is going on with China and China's relationship with the rest of the world because just by being vice chairman of Alibaba Group and, and working across the Pacific 
all the time, and, and actually you're watching as Alibaba Group grows all around the world, Joe has an, a, a very astute and nuanced understanding of how China relates to the global economy. And those are, frankly for me, just enlightening conversations where I get to learn um, as, as much as actually tell from my own experience. Alibaba, of course, is a colossus in uh, technology, in cloud computing, in AI increasingly, uh, in big data. Uh, I'm sure that they've been able to, to uh, give you tremendous assistance in that, the softball question kind of thing. Tell us, tell us how they've been able to, to uh, lend their strengths to your organization. What are some concrete ways in which that's, that's played out? The most concrete way is money. They've given us a bunch of money. To be very honest, uh, it, it's, uh, it's incredibly important for us to grow the newsroom, again, to invest the way we're, we're investing. And so, honestly, that is the primary advantage of being owned by Alibaba. We are, even if we are the world's most profitable news organization, we are not going to show up on the balance sheet. And for now, that means that, uh, that the board is very generous with investment. The other way, which is actually also a form of money, is that uh, when it comes to cloud computing, um, we have been able to transition a lot of our backend services onto AliCloud. This in no way, shape, or form is an advertisement for Ali. I would promise you that. Uh, but it, it means that it's much cheaper for us. Infrastructure costs for cloud computing are still a massive part of your expenditure as a technology company, especially as you scale. Being able to go onto Ali Cloud, which was just cheaper for us than Amazon, uh, makes our operating costs much lower. Besides that, there really there, there aren't a lot of actually very tactical relationships we have, direct relationships we have with Alibaba's operating units. In fact, even on the editorial side, uh, there have been moments where Jack has made some major announcement and we find out because the Wall Street Journal reported it, and we will reach out to Ali and be like, hey, how about a heads up next time? And the response we get from the PR team is, earn that right. Okay, the Wall Street Journal is more important for us right now than telling our story to the Western world, so earn that right. You want that access, earn that right. And of course, that doesn't make me feel great. And certainly our correspondents and our editors are kind of like moping in the corner. But the, the reality is that, you know what? That is good. That keeps, that, that makes, that is actually a sign of that independence. Is that? Uh, take that tough love that comes with lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, talk, take a lot when it comes with that much money. Uh, <laughs> but yes, anyway, that's, that's my answer. Long would answer to that. That, that kind of leads me on to the next question in the sense that, you know, Ali, Alibaba's PR folk are saying to you, get more important and influential. Um, I mean, that is a big challenge for a Hong Kong newspaper. You're trying to cover China for a global audience. Um, how, how is that going to work? Um, because that is a new mission, right, for, for the South China Morning Post. Um, so are you going <coughs> to operate in a lot of bureaus in other countries as well? Uh, and you know, as someone who's been trying to interest English language news consumers uh, about China for more than two decades, I feel the pain of, the, of this question. I mean, how do you plan to grow the world's interest in news from China? Jeremy, the answer is timing. Two decades ago, you were too early. Yeah, well, it, that's it, true. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. too late. <laughs> so, it, you're 100% right. Actually, maintaining our importance, or at the very least, maintaining our root and status as Hong Kong's newspaper record and reporting on China for the rest of the world is not an easy thing to do, mostly from, actually almost completely from a resourcing standpoint. Hong Kong is a very, very complicated uh, place, and it's getting increasingly com more and more complicated, and so reporting on Hong Kong requires a lot of resources, and of course, telling the story of China, 1.3 billion people, to the rest of the world, this rising economy that is nothing like any of us ever seen in human history is, even more complicated requires even more resources. So even though we have the advantages of being in investment mode, we will never have enough people. We have to figure out how to serve the Hong Kong people and the world at the same time. I refuse to give up on serving the Hong Kong people because if we lose our root in Hong Kong, we will not be able to view China with the objectivity that is required and accountable for us. And so what we are actually focusing on right now when it comes to, uh, to, to balancing those two things is establishing very real expertise 
on reporting on China across multiple different verticals that can also assist on, on, on telling the story of Hong Kong as it relates to China. You cannot tell Hong Kong's story today without talking about China. And I do think that we still probably tell the Hong Kong story more independently on China of China than we actually should. And I think that if we're able to reorganize our desks, our disciplines, hire in the right editors, and train our new staff uh, in new ways, we will be able to balance those two things better. Well, you are, as you say, the Hong Kong paper of record, but you're also viewed, at least in some quarters, as a, a paper belonging to the old Hong Kong establishment. And, no, at least from, from where I sit, so from the news as reported in, in the West, and like you said, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. Uh, it looks like Hong Kong's experienced a few years of some you know, serious tumults. You have, you have the you know, youthful uprisings, you have uh, a lot of people you know, who are suffering from serious economic dislocations, uh, a generation that isn't uh, going to live that and uh, you know your local uh, localism, you have the umbrella revolution you know, a few years ago. How are you positioning yourself when you're trying to serve that all important Hong Kong uh, leadership? As <clears throat> let me try so that again. Nervous. Uh, so I, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, we were just talking about third puberty outside. <laughs> <laughs> You've been talking a lot today. Thank you. The way that we address it is as an objective news organization, and so our role is to report all of it as objectively as we can. I would suggest that if you, if you want to understand the South China Morning Post, go back to 2014 archives and read our coverage of the Occupy Movement, the, the Umbrella Movement. And I do believe that the South China Morning Post, better than anyone else, as we should, because we're Hong Kong's paper of record, covered it with breadth and depth, with true objectivity. We covered both sides of the argument, and we continue to do that today. With Joshua Wong and the, the student leaders who are now in jail, we covered that event over the course of the last couple of months. Also, very comprehensively, both sides of the argument, people who believe that the judiciary overstepped their bounds, as well as people who believe that the judiciary did exactly what it was designed to do. In fact, quite recently, we published a great commentary um, by one of Joshua's very, very close friends, Jason Ng, who went to visit Joshua in jail. And Jason is a, is a contributor that we, we actually love working with because he tells us in a very, very human way, but also uh, with, with, with a, he's both a, 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 well, actually, I don't want to speak for him, but at least from our point of view, from a human and academic point of view of explaining why the pan-democratic movement um, exists and what the issues are that these student leaders really want to address in Hong Kong. We do not shy away from those things. We have called out the Hong Kong government over and over again on the fact that housing is a massive issue, education is a massive issue, the lack of mobility in a lot of ways, and I think most people in Hong Kong would identify the lack of mobility as one of the, uh, the, the lightning poles of this social uprising that's happening in Hong Kong. Absolutely. Certainly political reform becomes a part of it very quickly. And so our role is to report on all of this with objectivity. I think we've done a pretty good job. Yeah, um, I noticed from the bylines um, that there seems to be a pretty good mix now of Hong Kongers and Chinese people, mainland Chinese, you know, based on when you like the names. Is there a clash of cultures at all in the newsroom, like you're seeing at some of the university campuses in Hong Kong? I do not believe so. Now. It could be that no one has let me know about it yet, uh, but from all of my time in the newsroom and getting to meet these folks and, and exchanging ideas over and over again, I haven't seen it. I haven't heard it. We are, yes, we are 1,100 people, but we are small enough that these things would absolutely rise to the top. There is increasing transparency in the newsroom. We love different kinds of ideas, and people are constantly engaging one another, and like I said, even at the senior level, challenging one another's expectations. We have our Chinese journalists and reporters in Hong Kong. A lot of them are based in Hong Kong and sit side by side with our Hong Kong Chinese staff. We also are rotating our Hong Kong Chinese staff into mainland China. Uh, and with their, uh, their home return permits, they're able to go in and spend time in our bureaus across China. And so there really is a continuous exchange of ideas. I think it makes us better. Absolutely. Gary, you're a creature of, of technology. From the technology world, let's let's change subject here a little bit. And I mean, right across the border from Hong Kong is, of course, Shenzhen, which has, in, in the last decade or so, emerged as one of the great centers of technological innovation in the world. 
of course, it sits right on top of the supply chain. And people are able to to you know, to iterate very very quickly, to prototype very quickly, to roll out products super speed. What's happening in Hong Kong? I mean, why you know there have been these these different initiatives, the sniper and things like that, to try to stimulate innovation in Hong Kong. What's what's keeping it back? Is it simply the size of the market? Is it what, what is Hong Kong? This is the one I'm really going to get in trouble for. No, go for it. Because, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> because I, I really am still an outsider to Hong Kong. Um, I, I really do hope that at some point my wife and I earn status as insiders, as some, somebody who really understands Hong Kong, um, is able to engage deeply with Hong Kong. We've already come in 10 months to love Hong Kong. But as an outsider, and especially as a technologist, I am frustrated by what I see in Hong Kong when it comes to technology and startup development. Because this city has all of the ingredients you need, and has had all of the ingredients you need over the last 20 years to develop one of the world's great innovation ecosystems, and I don't see it today. It has the education, so access to human capital. It has the infrastructure, the, the power grid does not go down, and it has one of the fastest uh, consumer internet, or an average consumer internet speeds in the world. It has access to capital. It has the independent judiciary that protects IP. It has all of these things, and it's an incredibly international city that is fluent in both Chinese and English. Imagine being able to build for those two marketplaces from a city that uh, not only do you get the, 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 the beauty of a, a true metropolis, a global metropolis, but you can walk out your door and go hiking within 15 minutes, you have the beach right there. Like, it is a marvelous city. Why have people not moved there to build startups? So okay, I get it. it. It's the Hong Kong Tourism Board is going to make South China more than price Boy, uh, <laughs> me have asked the Hong Kong Tourism Board for a lot of money, and I don't think that's the case right now. So I, I think that here's what I have seen. I have seen that a lot of these underlying issues, uh, education and housing, have, have actually made it so that young people are unwilling or unable to take risks. And as entrepreneurs, you need to take risks. Most of the stuff that we do as tech entrepreneurs are terrible ideas, but you learn from those failures, you get better and better. And actually, if you talk about the Silicon Valley ecosystem, the good meetups, the good insider circles that actually create these incredible uh, leaders and new products that actually change the world are usually the ones where they are constantly sharing their f ups. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and that's something that that kind of failure and that the willingness of yes to yeah. share those failures doesn't really exist. And and the education system doesn't breed that, or at the very least teach that. Uh, throughout the entire education system, from grade school all the way through university, um, and capital doesn't incentivize those kinds of risk taking. So I think that those are, are, are major issues. We did say we would talk a little bit about uh, more of your ideas about the Western media coverage of China, quote unquote Western media coverage. Uh, I have kind of certain something that Jeremy and I talk about frequently, uh, but I'd love to hear your take on things. Uh, what, what do you think is is out of the primary issues, and how do you think the SCMP? can meaningfully address those problems, those shortcomings. So again, this is a massively oversimplified version of reality, but it makes the conversation easier to have. So excuse me. Yeah, we only have five more minutes. So yeah. <laughs> I see the, the media world that covers China as a dichotomy right now. You have on one side the perspective of Beijing. And we all know where that comes from and what the purpose of it is. That is propaganda coming from the state-owned mouthpieces. And on the other side, often very far on the other side, is the perspective of our Western media organizations, certainly the ones that I grew up with, the ones that I still love dearly today. And it is a perspective. I personally believe that part of the reason why there's a perspective, it's not because, I, I actually don't know, because I don't work in those organizations. I'm sure some people will claim that it's pure ideology. But I do think economics has a huge part to play in this. We have watched as foreign bureaus get cut in size. Down to skeleton crews and less and less foreign correspondents working in the regions of the world that actually need more journalists. And when you have only a couple of people working within China to cover this enormity of the country, how can you possibly cover it comprehensively? You can't. And so you pick a couple of big storylines, and 
then it leads to the ide ideology question of what the narrative is about China that your readers are expecting to some degree and also your editors believe in uh, and all of the, those things conflated leads to this a very uh, specific perspective. It is not wrong, it is just a perspective. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that it's a, it's a problem of the volume of coverage. Uh, you know, if I pick up the New York Times and read stories about the United States, I, I see uh, horrific reporting about uh, uh, racial strife in America. I know that that doesn't define the United States, right? There, there are going to be, you know, four or five very, very hard-hitting negative stories about this country that I live in. But I have the context. I grew up here. I read the rest of the paper, and it, it, it sort of gives me a, a more sort of balanced take. This is missing in China. We only have four stories about China in the Post of Times and the day. Right. Right. So I agree. And so this is where you guys come in, right? You guys can offer copious coverage. You can cover it in, in, in depth, right? That is our hope. We have one of the largest news operations of any foreign or outside media in, in mainland China. Right now, our bureaus in China altogether stand at about 40 people, and we have, and we, we have commitment to investing to grow that, uh, those, those bureaus all across China. When it comes to coverage, our Hong Kong and China coverage altogether, instead of four articles per day, uh, or 20 some articles per week, we publish now about 900 to 1,000 articles about Hong Kong and China on a weekly basis. So our coverage is wide, it is deep, and it's going to get wider and deeper, and hopefully it's going to get better, and that is the intent. Gary, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here. Uh, we will take some questions in just a bit, but it's, uh, it's time for recommendations first. Uh, before we get to recommendations, I do want to remind our listeners that the Cynical Podcast is powered by SubChina. Uh, check out the app and subscribe to the newsletter at subchina.com. You can follow SubChina on Twitter at, at SubChina News and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Sub China News. And if you like the Cynical Podcast, by all means, leave us a positive review on the Apple iTunes Store or on Google Play or wherever it is that you go to review apps. This really helps us and it means a lot more. Uh, now, Jeremy, recommendations, why don't you kick us off? Okay, right. just quickly, um, I mean, I'm somebody who's been reading the, uh, used to be the front page, and now it's the home page of the People's Daily and Xinhua News Agency for many, many years, uh, which is probably part of the problem inside my brain. Um, <laughs> and I, I still think that they're very important, but there's a great app uh, from the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, and they have a WeChat app that has a few headlines every day. And it's actually a really great way to get like real news about China, because the NDRC doesn't really you know, spit out propaganda, you know, like Xinhua and People's Daily, every second day, there's a story about how wonderful Xi Jinping is, or you know, a very long, boring story about military reform. Or, whereas the NDRC pretty much, you know, tells you, okay, drug prices are going to go somewhere. We're going to introduce some new rules. This is going to happen in the economy. So aside from the South China Morning Post and South China, another great news source, NDRC WeChat. That's a good one. Very good. All right, Gary, you're up. What do you have for us? This might be a little bit cliche for China watchers. There are two books I'm spending a bunch of time with right now because they're so relevant in this moment in time. The first is Richard McGregor's first book from 2010, The Party. Yeah. Because really with the Party Congress coming up on October 18th, and especially this one, it's fascinating to understand how the party operates. Um, and it's certainly from Richard's point of view, he's very, very academic in the way that he researched this book. It is fascinating to understand how the party wants the world to see it, or actually not see it, how it manages to uh, stay a single party state and, and how it manages to affect uh, everyone's life in, in China. So that's fascinating book. The second one, a little bit controversial in the course of the last few months, um, Harvard politics professor, political science professor Graham Allison wrote Destined for War, uh, which is about Thucydides' trap and how he believes that there's a possibility that China and the U.S. ends up in war. At the very least, history tells us that we have a potential of it. But he also does offer uh, a, a pathway towards peace. Um, and it really is, for, if for nothing else, the start of that book paints an incredible picture of what the rise of China actually looks like. I think we can all say that it is big, and it is important, and it is going to change the world. Uh, but he quantifies it in ways that I haven't seen before. So that clarity is fascinating. Excellent. I have not actually read Grant Allison's book yet, but uh, Jeremy uh, commissioned 
a scathing take. I, I, no, I didn't commission it. It was no, submitted. Yeah, it was yeah. submitted, right. Which I, I agree was, with. Yeah, it was scathing take. Yeah, after even like, you know, most of the ad hominem attack that was contained in it was removed, it was still really kind of full of vitriol. Anyway, well, uh, so I, I am from the English that. newspaper tradition right. where we think Our it's a good idea right. to yeah. be yeah. troll. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, my recommendation is also China related. This is actually a, a rare three China recommendations. Uh, usually, one of us is, is doing like some obscure band or something. Yeah, so you, who's that? <laughs> 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 anyway, so I, I have a new paper that's been uh, published by Merix, the Mercator Institute on China Studies. It's called Ideas and Ideologies Competing for China's Political Future How Online Pluralism Challenges Official Orthodoxy. Uh, it's by Kirsten Schrinkfer. Um, Marika Olberg, Simon Lang, and Bertram Lang. Uh, it looks at uh, debates in Chinese social media and it uses all sorts of survey data on Chinese medicines. Um, you can sort of think of it as having built on uh, a paper that we talked about on our podcast before about uh, ideology that was done by Jennifer Pan and Yiqing Xu. Uh, that was in uh, the spring of 2015. We'll put a link to that old podcast that's it's really worth looking at. Uh, what this Merrick's paper does is it identifies really interesting clusters of people. Uh, they they sort of look groups, different types of medicines, and, and they range from sort of, in a sort of upper left-hand corner who are, are sort of pro laissez-faire and embrace universal elements, the sort of US lovers, the humanists, uh, the, the, uh, the democratizers, and then in another, another corner, China advocates, Mao lovers, traditionalists, and then everything in between, including a very interesting corner of uh, equality advocates who I would equate with sort of the so-called new black body by uh, uh, just a, a small but quite influential group of academic thinkers. Anyway, we may end up doing, I think, an episode about that paper if we can get a hold of the right people when we go to Europe next spring. Uh, let me hear a very warm round of applause for Gary Liu. I think and Jeremy Goldcorn. Special thanks today to James Heimowitz and to Tinda Elliott from the China Institute for helping us. Yeah, hey. <laughs> and uh, drop us an email at Seneca at subchina.com. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash subchina news and follow us on Twitter at at subchina news. Thanks for listening and we will see you next week. Take care. Actually, uh, there's a is there a microphone? There is a microphone. Yeah. I saw. Right. Does it work? I saw it. This was fun hiding behind this thing the entire time. But I have never been accused to have a face that wasn't for radio. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine. You guys didn't see this, but I've been drooling and I've spinach in my teeth all the whole time. Love it. Questions? Okay, well, let me start with this gentleman right up here. Uh, first of all, Gary, thank you very much. Identify yourself. My name is Kevin. Hey, um, and first of all, thanks for coming on the show and thanks for hosting this. Uh, Kaiser and Jeremy, learned a lot. Uh, my question for you, Gary, you mentioned how South China Morning Post wants to inform the world about China. And you are a, a news organization, a traditional news organization, even though it's primarily digital, it's still a traditional newspaper format. And now, the way people consume news is very different today than it was in the past. Because it used to be that newspapers were the gatekeepers in the final authorities. And now there's podcasts like this, and blogs, and Twitter. And a lot of people, for example, our president bypasses the media completely to tweet. And I'm just wondering, like, where do you see your newspaper fitting into kind of like this um, in how people get information about the world. Where does your paper fit in? And also, 
are you changing the paper in any ways to make it more digestible for today's audience? Yeah, so that's a good question. I actually wish we had addressed this on the podcast. Um, the newspaper is one of our products. That's the big change. The newspaper is one of our products. In fact, today, as of uh, about a month or so ago, we now have a dedicated print team that assembles the newspaper that actually removes the accountability of assembling the newspaper from the rest of the newsroom. Now, instead of 300 people worried about what tomorrow's newspaper is going to look like, it is 20. And what that means is that everyone else is writing and editing for all of our other digital distribution channels and thinking about what that next phase of digital growth is going to look like from a product and editorial point of view. And a small team of people are assembling the newspaper for the Hong Kong audience to sell a flagship product in that city and remain that for quite some time. So to answer your question, our newspaper does not fit in to our global ambition. But all of these other editorial products I'm talking about do. What the distribution on Facebook looks like, on Twitter, on across aggregators, uh, what our, our, our new editorial products, newsletters and whatnot could look like for Southeast Asia and other parts of the world, those are all formats that we're going to spend a lot more time investing in and experimenting with. Now, you made a really good point. I don't know if you meant if you meant this, uh, about the format and, and the way that we write. And that is something we're also going through transformation on. Because the way that you write news, especially for a newspaper, used to be, again, I'm generalizing, but a big story comes up and we are going to, we know that there's gonna be a package of 10 stories that addresses this one issue. And of those 10 stories, maybe four of them are going to be front page stories. There can be two editorials spread out over the course of a couple of days, and then maybe four or five other commentaries that we want to bring in from multiple different perspectives. And we know that our readers are going to read the paper from at least the main book from start to finish, and they will be able to, at the very least, touch most of those pieces of news. And that, holistically, is objective news. Today, the experience with news is singular. It's one article at a time. If that one article does not give you all of those viewpoints, suddenly either your newspaper becomes biased or somebody's understanding becomes biased. And so that is something we as a news organization have been thinking a lot about. We are testing internally formats that allows us, and it's not just the links in the middle of articles, we're testing formats and new editorial product that allows us to share multiple perspectives, or at the very least, the holistic unit of news and a single screen. It's, it's a very hard thing to do on a five inch screen, okay? And the second thing is we do realize that writing for an, for an international audience, more, more, more of the time, if, even if we do this three, four articles as a package, we need to have a team that can package those together into a single definitive article for international marketplace that is not going to take the time to read three, four articles on an issue. Those are all adjustments we're starting to make. Yeah. Did a workshop on how people. Okay, well, I'm standing here, so I'll go with you first, and then I'll come over to you for a second. Hi, I'm Jamie Fleischman. He's our former intern when he was in your region. Yeah. Um, and, and you picked the right guy. <laughs> and I have a little bit more personal question. I'm curious, uh, Jeremy Kaiser mentioned that you were born in California, grew up in Taiwan, and your previous work at Dig and Spotify obviously didn't have a China connection, as far as I know. I'm curious about your decision more personally to move to Hong Kong. Uh, to have a China-related job now, and yeah, what what made, what you thought about that decision? That is such a good question. Um, okay, so really quickly, my background: my parents are Taiwanese whites, and which means that my grandparents ended up in Taiwan with the retreating Kuomintang army after the Mao's revolution. So our parents knew each other probably. Probably, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're definitely friends. We might be related. Who knows? <laughs> I'm gonna try and grow my hair out, see if it goes earlier. <laughs> um, and, and so, actually. Um, I grew up, and I, I lived from, I was born in Southern California, I lived from when I was a few months old to five years old in Taiwan, where my parents are from, and then New Zealand for education for nearly 10 years, then 20 years in the United States. Uh, among all of those cultures, I'm by far, I, the, the, the one that over indexes is America. I'm extremely American in the way that I see the view of the world, and the way that I operate, and the fact that I'm loud and obnoxious. Um, and, so I have actually always, in my entire life, had this identity crisis. Even the Chinese side of me, I haven't been able to figure out because my parents love Taiwan, but they don't have an isolationist view or a separatist view of Taiwan, um, nor are they advocating for 
Reunification. Whatever, yeah, reunification. I don't want to use that word, but they're advocating for the status quo. I think, I think in general, you were to ask them. And so they instilled in me an understanding and appreciation for China and China's culture, a love for the country of Taiwan, and certainly the, uh, the even the fact that I'm saying country is going to piss a bunch of people yeah. off. But the country of Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the old moment uh, that I mentioned. Yeah, I know. Uh, 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 get the red phone next. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, a lot of people already assume I have one, which I don't. Um, and 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 how and what that country actually means for them. And then I struggled because and then I grew up in the, the, the British education system that viewed America not so kindly, um, and then grew up in the American education system that, well, doesn't give a crap about the British at all. For the rest of the world. For the rest of the world. And so I've been very conflicted. Now, to the root of the question, why did I go? And I've heard life, we love New York City. This is still always going to be home. Why did I go? Uh, practically speaking, there is no other opportunity like this in the world, and probably not another one is going to come around in my lifetime or even in the next, where a news organization that is like the South China Morning Post is going through a moment of transformation with the resources to actually transform successfully, and while covering a moment in time where a country rises to become number one economic superpower in the world, passing another one, and that relationship is fraught with possibility. That moment is just, I mean, for me, practically, it was, it was easy to say yes to that. More personally, I want to participate in helping, and this is really going to be hallmark and cliche, I've said this so many times that I'm trying to figure out whether I still believe it, but I really, I think I do. Um, <laughs> sincerely, I want to understand my own culture. I want to make sure that when my kids grow up as global citizens, that they have access to more comprehensive information about China and what China's rise means for the rest of the world. And I do not believe that comprehension exists today. And if I can participate in that, uh, Okay, more questions? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, more questions? All right, you and then I'll come back to you. Hi, uh, thank you so much. My name is Shen. I'm a color, uh, current Columbia student. And before uh, I came here, I was a journalist in China for four years. I'm still working for Chinese, uh, two Chinese uh, companies right now, uh, media companies right now. So my question is that, because um, in the past two years, I was I, I have been a freelancer for two ch Chinese digital platforms, like focusing on like uh, business reporting uh, in between U.S. and China. So I have a was observation that because the like, two companies are also like trans from transforming from news newspaper to digital platforms. But uh, once they started to like expansion to, um, to, for their online business, uh, the quantitative uh, the the number of the articles and also the quality number of articles they required is growing, but the qualities of the journalism still decline. So my question is that, like for as she as as the MP, uh, you started to this kind of strategy, transformation strategy. How can you make sure the, quant the the number of the articles you require at the same time to make sure the quality of the uh, your journalism? And my second question is that can we ask just yeah. one? Just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's related. It's related. How like based on your strategy? Quality and quantity. Okay. How can you build up your newsroom? Okay. Can you talk more? So I personally don't think that quality and quantity are uh, are mutually exclusive. I believe that a news organization who has the right technology and the right training for their journalists can increase quantity. And right funding. Yes, that's a huge deal. It really is so to have more resources. Can increase the volume as well as the quality of the journalism at the same time. We have to provide our journalists and our editors with better tools. A lot of, of course, the, the, the amount of time necessary for reporting, actually getting the story itself for news gathering is not going to change. So that is a matter of resources. The more journalists we have in the field, the, 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 the more quality content we're going to create. But tools internally are able to actually sh shrink and contract the amount of time necessary to go from raw copy to high quality journalism across multiple different formats. Absolutely, tools will be able to do that. Um, and so we want to invest in making sure that our journalists are armed with the right tools, our editors are armed with the right tools, so that all of their time is spent in the field and reporting, 
and then the, the, the process of editing and getting the story to our audience becomes easier and easier and less and less time consuming. Another thing I will say to this, and this has been a little bit controversial, especially when I've been talking about it in Asia, because right now SMP seems to be the only company talking about this. We're not doing it yet, but we're talking about it. It's the fact that I believe the rise in artificial intelligence is going to be a massively disintermediating factor for the news industry that we are not spending anywhere near enough time about. But if we're not disintermediated by it, we are actually going to benefit from it. Okay, and the huge part of it is that AI will allow us to do natural language generation, which means a lot of the commodity news, literally, on the, especially for you since you write business news, a lot of the stuff that you don't want to be doing writing about indices going up and down and quarterly reports and whatnot, those things can be done by, by machine more accurately than actually humans can do it, much faster than humans can do it. That doesn't replace you as a journalist. It frees you up to go do the right kind of journalism to be able to actually enlighten and elevate the understanding of the world, right? And so that is what I'm looking forward to for the future of our company. We're setting up the infrastructure right now. Maybe in three years, we'll be able to start experimenting with these things so that our journalists can spend their time on high quality journalism. Excellent. So two, 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 final, two final questions, very quick, because we've got one and then one more, but make it quick. Hi, uh, my name is Cesare Paco. Um, Wall Street Journal, and I've been helping my Asia colleagues cover Wu and Gui. And just last week, we published an interview with them. And for various reasons, a very difficult figure to cover. I'm wondering what uh, the SCMP's approach has been to writing about him. What pressure, if any, you received from Beijing, and how you dealt with it? Yeah, we've been we've been writing a lot about Wu and Gui, uh, and we haven't gotten pressure to to stop. Um, our problem is access. We used to have direct access to Wu and Gui. We no longer have direct access to Wu and Gui. Uh, and I don't actually know why. It might be because the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal are doing such a good job, uh, are helping him. These two organizations are, are certainly helping him get his message and his side of the story out so well. That's the reality of it. A lot of the access we have and the stories that we are published on Google, we, we are trying to find balance here. Uh, but there is a lot of other stuff. Like there, there is a lot of uh, reporting coming out of China from our sources that are not propaganda sources that uh, are, are effectively pushing back and saying, some of his claims are not not truthful. And, I, and the New York Times really? and the Wall Street <laughs> Journal are actually telling those stories, but they're, they're not the ones in those newspapers that are getting the most attention because they're not as salacious as the claims he's making. And we're trying to balance that. Uh, so no, we have not gone uh, pressure to stop reporting on what was going on with Wall Street. Check out the Sunica okay. podcast through uh, interview with Mike Horsehide and Alex Hatch. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, man, he has been doing some awesome reporting on that. It's been so okay. much fun. One yeah, final, one final question. Over here. From, from the, the past, so go ahead. Thanks. Uh, John Han from 21st Century Business Herald. Uh, thank you for the uh, So my question is that um, I think a lot of things happening in like your previous world, uh, tech, tech world, and Silicon Valley, such as the Chinese management in Silicon Valley, such as the um, uh, White House and the Congress bring up cases against uh, merger and acquisitions from Chinese companies. So I'm wondering what, how do you see the competition in the tech world between China and US? And what, what is the biggest story in your mind in, between Silicon Valley and China? Thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. I do think that China's rise in the technology front is massively underreported by us as well. By the way, we, we have not done a good job of actually telling that holistic story yet. Um, to, to, I mean, the point that we've been making, and certainly to Kaiser's point, if you've ever been to Shenzhen, boy, my, you, know, you have to go every year, because it, the city changes every single freaking year. And uh, it, it is such an incredible story about the rise of innovation in China, and there's so many things that I sincerely believe in. This is coming from an American technologist who loves the navel-gazing nature of our technology industry here. I love thinking that we are, we know more than anyone else and that we're always going to innovate faster than anyone else, but there's so many aspects of China Tech that I think are just faster and better than the United States at this point. Artificial, Good. artificial intelligence is one of those. Um, our government is certainly paying attention to the rise of AI in China and the innovation speed of AI in China. I think our tech industry is not yet. 
And it's because we're arrogant. I think that the tech industry in the United States has a tendency to be arrogant. And I think that we're going to be caught off guard. Suddenly, we're going to realize that the artificial intelligence that can operate an actually fully automated vehicle is not actually coming from Uber or Google. That it's probably coming from China. That there are other aspects. I mean, we, we talk, you guys hear all these stories about uh, the cashless payment systems in China. Until you're in Beijing and Shanghai and realize you never, ever, ever have to have cash. You see that homeless dude with a QR code, and I don't know, you're laughing. That is not a joke. And you go to the wet markets where the, these are, you know, like, and everyone has a QR code, and you, you do not ever need cash. And, and you realize how liberating that experience is. And then you go to Hong Kong, and everything's in cash, and you get pissed off. Until that moment happens, you don't understand why when we're talking about cashless payment systems, why it has completely changed a generation of people, their purchase habits, the volume of consumption they do, because it's way too easy to buy stuff, um, and, and how, honestly, the United States would change if that were ever able to actually make it over here uh, across the Pacific. If you're interested in technology coverage, keep your eyes on this space here, because oh the Pacific Podcast is going to be launching a new podcast in, in coordination with GTV, a big Silicon Valley PC that's very active in China. It's going to be called 996, which means the we work from nine to nine, six days a week. That's what you're saying. Sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be talking to all sorts of... Hold on, seven of those hours are ping pong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hey. So, big All right, thanks all for coming, everyone. Thank hey, you. Enjoy. And, and uh, we'll see you soon. What about the fun ones and activities? That's right, come.